Mean O-Line Media presents the Business First Podcast. Hi, y'all, and welcome to a new episode of Business First with Sonia Aline. I am your host, and today I'm excited to have in the studio Ryan Lasan, who is a master your mindset coach. And I've worked with coaches, I've been coached, I have coached, and I'm excited to talk about or have this conversation today because my frustration with some of the coaches that I have worked with is that sometimes I feel like the focus has been always on the actions. And before you can have effective actions, you really do have to have a strong mindset. And so I am so excited to hear um, your perspective and your journey, Ryan, in terms of how you've been able to um, effectively coach the women that you have. You had some great testimonials on your site and they all are saying the same thing right? That you've challenged their beliefs and you've gotten them to think differently. And so before we get into the the specifics of your work, I would like to get a sense of what got you here and what inspired you. The name of your company is Inspire Brand Consulting, but what inspired you to do this important work? Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. And thank you to your listening audience and to the listener that's listening to this podcast. I am very excited about this conversation. And as you gave the introduction, I literally, my heart burst with excitement that yes, it's going to be such a juicy, fun conversation because we are twinsies when it comes to the philosophy of essentially advancement, change management, personal development, which is this idea is that action is important. And I will talk about action. Action oftentimes, well, actually, I'm going to hold on to that even. Mm, I'm going to hold I'm going to hold that to see where the conversation goes. Action is important. However, we tend to act on what we believe. On what we believe about ourselves, on what we don't believe about ourselves, on what we believe about our value, what we don't believe about our value. So we do what we believe. And if we have beliefs that say I'm not enough, which every human being carries some degree of a belief of I'm not enough. And where people and I tend to intersect is where that belief is so overwhelming that they're finding themselves very smart and very talented and not in action because it is so much that they aren't, they aren't taking action. And, and so it's really about the believability What are you believing? What are your beliefs? And that is the core of the work that I do. I'm so passionate about it. I love to get in there and I love talking about business strategies. I love talking about marketing and communications and being an entrepreneur and all those things. It's so wonderful. It's so great. And at the end of the day, if you don't believe it, it's not going to happen. And so how did I get here? There's a couple of different intersections that I could mention. One is my parents, quite honestly. Both of my parents, my father is a passionate lover of personal development, the mind, how it works on a quest of like really figuring it out. My mother is a fantastic, phenomenal, intuitive coach who sees the vision for someone and helps them incrementally get there. So my business literally is like the genesis of my family, so much so. And I could also say that it's my schooling. I went to an all women's high school. I went to an all women's African American uh, Black institutional um, institution college. So it, my passion for women and Black women specifically could come from that. But it really came. Uh, my business came when I was finishing my career um, as a student at Georgetown for my master's degree and starting a passion project. So I started something called Inspire Sunday Brunch back in 2012. And it was this platform for me, For the, I created this platform to talk to my network, my girlfriends about vision boarding, about setting intentions. And I had not intended it for it to become a business, but it was a real passion project for several years. And then I was at a point in my career about 2014, where I felt undervalued, overworked, uh, underappreciated, which I now know and own and help people to recognize that that's a very good sign that you have outgrown where you are. And so I didn't realize that at the moment, it was very uncomfortable, right? Very, very uncomfortable. And at the same time, Georgetown, my alma mater was offering a workshop for about four or five women taught by a female coach. And we came in on a Saturday and she asked me this pivotal question. And this is really what took my passion project and 
which was already in my purpose, but aligned it with the deeper meaning um, of my purpose. And the question was, do you talk to yourself as if you are your own best friend? And that question struck me square between the eyes in so many different ways. One, it was that warm, oozy, yucky feeling that Brene, Dr. Brene Brown talks about, which is shame. No, I do not talk to myself as if I am my own best friend. In fact, I felt a real sense of, wow, you know, I present as a very optimistic, very loving, very championing of other people. But the way that I talk to myself is very, is very rigid. It was very demanding. It was very black or white. It was cloaked in truly a fixed mindset. If I'm not already where I'm supposed to be, then can I get there? And see, the thing about beliefs is that none of that is an internal experience. We're not telling ourselves, oh, well, isn't that interesting that there's that shame feeling? And oh, isn't it interesting that you're saying that you don't believe something? Or isn't it interesting that you notice that you're not kind to yourself? What it looks like on the inside is, I don't know if I can do it. What are people going to say? What is it going to be like? What's it going to turn out to be? How am I going to make this happen? What are they going to think about me? And that train of thinking is one that leaves particularly high achieving people in a loop of procrastination, overwhelm, anxiety, self-doubt, second guessing. And I discovered in that moment that one, I am not my own best friend. And two, this is exactly what I'm supposed to help people overcome. This is the thing to really help people to begin to shift their inner dialogue, the inner conversation that they're having, which is based on their beliefs and to help them shift that from a feeling of I'm not enough to I am capable. I have what it takes. I am. I trust myself. I trust that I can create exactly what it is that I'm looking to create. And I also want to share with the listening audience that I had all the things, you know, I had all the degrees, (laughs) I had all the successes. So I mean, I'm I'm not talking about and there's no no judgment as to where people are. But I am talking about a high functioning, very articulate, successful blueprint, made it through the adult lifing doing it. um, And the inner experience, what's happening behind the mask, I help people take off their mask and to really resolve what's happening behind that mask that's keeping them from creating the life that they most love to live. There's so much that you um, expressed just now that is has touched me and, and I'd like to be able to um, expand further. First of all, I love the intersection of, you know, your, your father's thinking and his passion and, and your mom's interest as well. Because I think what we're seeing today is a merging of what people used to call the woo-woo, right? These, this, this feeling, what intuitiveness is. And now all that there's science backing up all of this stuff that we've learned from Eastern studies, from African studies about you are what you think, right? And you are what you feel. Um, the, the other piece that I, that I think is, is really important is that we always have discussions around fear, right? But we very rarely have discussions around shame, particularly for high functioning and high achieving professionals. And so I would imagine that many of your clients who at least recognize that they need coaching are probably coming in and saying, yeah, like, I know I'm good, right? Like, I know I'm, I know I'm great. To your point, I have the degrees, I have the titles, I have the, the job, even if I don't have the title and the money that I expect, I, ha- I definitely have the work experience. This is what I've done. This is what I've achieved. And I love myself. I know I love myself. Look at me, right? So, so how, do you, how do you start to break down that exterior, right? Because what you're saying is it's not all of what we see on the outside. It really is this thing that I'm imagining that women are actually struggling with if they can't articulate it or can't express it or can't look at themselves and say, I don't understand why that I'm not further along. Um, How much of a challenge is that for you? And what do you recommend people who will want to take up coaching with you or will want to make these first steps to change themselves? 
Um, mm-hmm. What is the process for doing that? Or what, you know, what are the first steps for doing that? Absolutely. A wonderful question. And I hear, I hear several points within that question. One, I, it sounds like, what are people feeling or sensing or sort of where are they when they and I intersect? Where where do we meet? Where are they kind of when we meet? And I would absolutely agree with you that most of the people that I see when they pick up the phone and we're having a discovery call, a complimentary discovery call, which is how I initially engage with individuals. They can say, I have this degree. I have this, you know, 20 years of work experience. I have these titles. I have all of this expertise and all this understanding. And then there's a really big but. And that but is latent with shame. They don't have to say it. And oftentimes, oftentimes as in, as humans, particularly in the West, as you know, individuals in the West, we don't have a very robust emotional language. We don't, you know, we don't have like a, we, we have the words shame, blame, guilt, but we particularly, if you're 40 and under, we were not taught how to really label our feelings, feel the feelings. They're just there, right? And those feelings don't feel good. So people don't say, I feel a lot of shame. What they say is, I should be able to do this. I should be, I should be further. I should have acquired this. I should already know how to do this. I should have this thing. I should be where they are. I should be doing the thing that I said I was going to do. I should, should is latent with shame. Shouldn't. So if you're shooting on yourself, there's a good chance that there's low frequency, shame, blame, guilt, feelings that are associated with that thought process. And so when people call me, they do want desperately to love themselves. They know that they are lovable. And yet there's this disconnect between what they seemingly are able to achieve in contrast to what they're experiencing. And while on paper, that may look like a few thousand dollars or the next title or even a new interest, but internally that struggle continues to ring the alarm of, I'm not enough. I'm not enough and I can't do it. I can't figure it out. I'm trying everything that I can and it's not working. And so by the time someone connects with me, oftentimes they are that the mask, they're ready for that mask to come off, not for the world to see it, but they're ready to put down that mask and say, there's something going on internally where my resume and my inner self-concept, they don't meet, they're not married. You know, I know I've done these things, but my inner conversation is questioning whether I can really do this, questioning whether I belong. And so that's, that's generally where I, where people find me is having that inner dialogue. How much, and, and this is, this could be an interesting question. Um, as you were talking, you know, there's a lot of dialogue around being the victim, right? And a lot of times because of racism, because of sexism, and because of all, all the isms that we absolutely know that exist, is it your thought that sometimes we can be stuck in victimhood for just reasons that I don't want to, I don't ever want to dismiss the the impact of racism, sexism, and all the other isms on, on people. But I've had discussions and I've, I've been exploring this is, can we sometimes just be stuck in victimhood and that be part of why it is so difficult for us to be able to move forward. When, when I when I think about a lot of some of the influencers, some of the conversations, some of the the books that exist, talk about all talk about how heavy the challenges is. Talk about how heavy the challenges are, how heavy the load is. And I'm wondering if that is also just really burdensome to keep hearing and to keep in our subconscious as we're trying to um, develop ourselves further. Oh, Sonia, I think it is a big one. I really do. And I think it's one that's very delicate and one that can be really challenging to talk about. And I could, I could feel and sense even your own challenge of how to parse out these words, you know, these words that are very loaded and every person has their own distinction or context for what a word is, right? So it can be mucky, really trying to, you know, work out these, these answers, but 
here, here's what I want to share about that because I, I completely agree with you. And there is a book by Michael Beckwith called The Life Visioning Process. And it's a book that I'd recommend that specifically talks about this idea of victimhood. And the way that he frames it, and the reason that I I am recommending this book for anyone who's considering this idea of victimhood, what does this mean? Particularly if when you hear the word, you have a, a bristle about it, that bristle could mean that there's more to explore there. Okay. So the way that Michael Beckwith positions victimhood is one, he's talking about mentalities. He's talking about ways of seeing ourselves, self-concept. He talks about victimhood as being the first like lower um, self-concept. And it is one where it feels like, let me actually say this. No one likes the word victim. No one wants to be a victim, right? So like, let's just put the word aside and let's put the experience at the forefront. And what I liked about his book and his explanation about the word that we're putting off the table, which is victimhood, is that our victim mentality is that he really talks about the essence of the experience. This is what I want to talk about the essence. If you find yourself in internal dialogue, external dialogue with other people saying things like feeling things, more importantly, feeling things like, why is this happening to me? Why can't I get out of the situation? This is so overwhelming. It's taking over who I am. I can never seem to get out from under this. This always feels like it's taking a hold of me. There's this feeling that life is out of control and life is taking over you. Life is being done to you and you are lacking agency. And see, the ego mind says, oh, that's not me, but I just feel like I can't lose this weight and I just don't know why. And I just, it just keeps happening. That's, that is it. That's it. That's, that's the, I just, I, with my business, I just can't, I just, I, I, I cannot figure out how to create a marketing plan. And every time I spend time on it, it feels like I'm wasting time, losing money. I don't, that whole cycle is in fact, whether we like it, love it. Ooh, we hate it. Oh my gosh. How could I be a victim? That is victim mentality. That's what it is. It is life is happening to us. And this is, this is so important because One, so you did a beautiful job of really laying out the sensitivity to this question because there are a lot of isms, right? And you take a person like you and I, we have a lot of intersectionality of isms, racism, you know, sexism, classism, ageism, if you, depending on where it is, you know what I mean? What the spectrum is. So all, all the things. Now, where does a person delineate that's the outside world's concept and this is now my concept of me, of who I am? Well, the fact is, is that that delineation is very permeable, I guess you would say. It, it's, it's, things are permeating. Things are coming into our psyche. We have lived lives as children. I'm raising a child. I'm watching the conditioning happen to her own mindset, right? The conditioning that happens on a loving knee, I talked to a woman this morning who said to me, and this is sharing a a theme, not anything personal about her, but she shared with me that she is a child of immigrants and she, she has a business that's very aligned with her passion and her purpose. And she has this vision of being able to work in her business in a way that's fun and fulfilling. And then her mind says, are you joking? This is business. This is money. You're not supposed to be having fun. And so... This belief, like, let's talk about what that is. That's a sh- so what happens is here she is brushing her teeth Wednesday morning, brushing her teeth. She's starting her day. She's really putting it on. I'm going to be so positive today. I've got this business. I love it. I'm going to think about these fun things. And then this is what happens. It is no one's fault if they are attacked by somebody. If you are a victim of a crime, that is not your fault. So this is what happens inside of ourselves. This is the duality that happens. Fear, let's call it for the sake of just talking about our inner being, let's call it a person, a thing. Let's call it fear. Fear, you're brushing your teeth, you're trying to be, you know, I'm unconscious, and, but fear is, and what if fear lives in the subconscious mind, which is 95% of who we are, fear just sneaks on in and it says, 
well, what are you going to do about, um, how are you going to make this happen? How are you going to, how are you going to make that happen? What are you going to do about this thing? Why did you say that thing? What are they going to think over there? Suddenly fear literally has hijacked you. It has slapped your face and stole your purse. Okay. Your conscious mind is now like, oh my God, I am suddenly, I'm having anxiety. I'm overwhelmed. Well, yes. The, the thought that you just had the whole series of thoughts of what am I going to do? What am I going to say? How am I going to make this happen? What are they going to say? That is aligned with a victim way of thinking that it even matters what someone's going to say, or that when you show up, you're not going to be enough. That thought, that belief has hijacked your conscious, has hijacked your whole mind, your whole being down to your toenails, you're feeling stress. And so in that moment, you, me, whomever has become a victim to that thought. So yes, to become real with like, wow, that's what's happening to me. I have become a victim to this fear. I have, be- I have internalized this thought. I have, en- I have embraced this to be real about myself. And they're so elusive. They're hard to catch. It's hard to catch the belief that, oh, right. I was taught that I can't enjoy my business and that's actually not true. It's false. I can create a whole nother way of thinking. I can actually move into a manifester mentality, which is one that says I'm responsible. I can do this. So yes, I think Sonia, your question is spot on in a very sensitive one and one that it really behooves us to recognize when we have fallen into victimhood so that we can get ourselves out and move into other higher realms of thinking. Yeah, I I totally related to the a thought feeling like an attack because, and most of us are not conscious of it, right? Because our thoughts are have become our programs, and so to think of it as um, an attack because you can easily that, that's happened to me. You can easily be brushing your teeth, having an amazing thought about how the day is going to run, and then all of a sudden, maybe it's, it's an email that comes in or a text message that comes in that zaps you right back to quote unquote reality, right? One of the things, uh, in, in, there were a lot of things that were said about um, in in some of your um, testimonials and even in some of the, the videos that you have online, but I love the idea of autonomy and resilience and being able to um, experience that. And so what does that look like when um, professionals can gain well, I think resilience we're familiar with. I think that's that's mm-hmm. something that that we're we're credited with as a race. If you talk about particularly black women, right, mm-hmm. um, that we're always resilient. But the autonomy with resilience is um, is a powerful uh, combination. And so, what can that look like for people who have gone through your program? Absolutely. So, you know, I'm going to couple that with the last question that was asked. This idea of of Almost, you can see that I'm like parsing my words. Because the word victim is so latent, while I totally agree with what I just said, I I do want to take it off of the table for for this answer, but I want to leave the essence of the idea that we each, as individuals, as human beings, we each have internalized conditioning. What makes the intersection of a black woman, for example, distinctly different than a white male's is the intersection of being black and a woman and the cultural and like construct that that means. Meaning I was talking to a white woman the other day about this very subject and the, about, you know, what does it mean for a particularly like a black woman to experience imposter syndrome? How might that be different than a white woman? And she, as a white woman, gave me an experience that she had where I think probably for the first and only time she felt because of her environment, she felt unsafe. Physically, she felt unsafe. And she said that in that awareness, oh, I could almost cry. She said, I felt the empathy that people must feel when they don't feel safe inside their bodies, inside their skin. And so when you have people, a person who has been conditioned that they're not safe, and then maybe they've had some experiences 
that say that they're not safe. And those experiences might not even be racially motivated, but the person is one person. So everything inside of them intersects, everything connects. Because I'm me, I've had this experience. Okay. And so it's become internalized. So now let's say this person is at the top of their game. They're the COO of an organization or they're the business owner of their business and they're poised for an opportunity. They're ready for the next seat at the table and they're preparing for an interview or they're preparing perhaps for a client consult or what have you. And they're there they are again. They're brushing their teeth in the mirror on a Wednesday morning, having conversations with themselves. And they might say things like, you know, those people, you know, not everybody wants you there. What if this person finds out that your X, Y, Z, whatever, fill it in. What's going to happen when they know? So this inner conversation that this person is having is literally eroding their confidence in real time. It is taking away their agency. So when I talk about agency and I help individuals really close their confidence gaps to identify their personal brands, it is for them to begin to recognize within their inner dialogue that says things like, oh, I can hear that voice self. I can hear the voice that says, and I can even feel the feelings. I can feel the intensity of the fear that says these people, whomever these people are, don't want you here for whatever reason. I can I can hear myself say that. I can hear the thoughts. And I have become familiar with that fear within myself. I become familiar with the feeling of that feeling of fear within myself. And I become so agile because of these eight steps that Ryan has taught me to use that I can look at that fear and I can turn to it and say, I don't believe you. I'm taking my agency. I am taking, and the thing is, is that we're taking our agency back from ourselves, back from our conditioning, back from our own fear, false evidence that appears real because there's no one else in the bathroom whispering sweet nothings into the sweet person's ear except for themselves. And so that is how our agency can be hijacked in a matter of microseconds by ourselves. And so what I teach people to do is to claim that agency back to say, well, First of all, the only reason I have the opportunity is because I am me. They people want me here. I have made my way. I have, but oftentimes, particularly we're in, when we're in growth phases, when we're stretching ourselves to take next leaps, when we're attaining our goals, we're in achievement. Our mental hygiene isn't strong enough to keep us buoyed, you know, to keep us, oh, I can do this girl. You can do this girl. You can do this girl. That's why it's that best friend, that best friend that's championing you all the time. You can do it. You can do it. Girl, don't worry about that. Dust that off. Don't you know that it's all right? Da, 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 da. Right. We, so we're, we, we really owe it to ourselves, particularly as black women to learn how to become our own best friends, because that's where our agency is going to come from. We're going to get ourselves off of that hook. No girl, you're fine. Keep brushing your teeth. You're amazing. Mm -hmm. I didn't mention it before, but I love the idea of uh, talking to yourself as your own best friend. Um, I know it, it equates to loving yourself. And I think that most of us will say that we love ourselves. But when you when you had phrased it as talking to yourself as a best friend, that made it a little bit more crisp in terms of the relationship that you actually have with yourself. One of the things I wanted to say in the beginning of the um, of our conversation and that I it, it's totally appropriate now and I'd like for you to um, explain it a little more. It's on your website. I, it's, it's a very powerful phrase, but you say it's impossible to advance your professional dreams and hide your brilliance at the same time. And I was just like, absolutely. Right. Like, because again, most of us believe that we are even though we, we struggle with this, this internal dialogue, most of us, again, because of what we've accomplished, because of our experience, we recognize that there's a brilliance that maybe we're thinking no one else is recognizing, right? Or maybe sometimes we think it's, it's not enough. But for us to be able to achieve what we need to achieve, we do have to totally embrace it all. And so if you could please um, talk about why that was so important for you to put on the beginning at the, at, at, right on the, on the homepage of your website, but what that means for you when you're working with your clients. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Because that 
I think that that is very core fundamental to what I believe as a coach and as a person is that we cannot hide in advance at the same time. And what I and what I'm specifically talking about is hiding one you can't hide and be seen at the same time. Let alone hiding what I call your brilliance, which is your natural strengths, your core values, your um your quirks, your passions, your mistakes, your wisdom, it is all, it is the essence of who you are. And when we look at how we tend to show up in life, even in our most intimate relationships, there is a sense of hiding. If somebody really knew who I was or that I didn't take a shower this morning or that I don't drink enough water or that these also oh, things about herself or that I had a child when I was young or that I made this mistake or that I made this failure or that I got a divorce or these life things happen. We experience them. If only someone knew that I stole something when I was five years old, I would be unlovable. And it's because as human beings, we have foundational disbeliefs about ourselves. And if someone only knew, then I would be rejected. And it's primal to who we are. It's, you know, Dr. Brene Brown talks about belonging. I mean, it's, it's very essential to who we are is this sense of belonging. And so um, when, when that is questioned, do I belong? Am I valuable? Am I here? We begin to hide. We begin to cloak ourselves. And as high functioning adults, oftentimes, whether we know it or not, but our degrees, our experience, our expertise, those can actually act as armor. They can act as defense mechanisms. Well, see, I have all these beautiful handbags or see self, we have this title, but inside I'm still that person who's questioning whether I belong. And so the more we're able to tap into our brilliance, more we're able to tap into even our quirks or tap into our mistakes and own them and feel well with who we are, we're really able to show up in that way. And I'm going to give a very short example of how that actually happened today in my life. So I am a person where if my birthday were not on the calendar, I would miss it. Okay. So today there was an opening at one o'clock on my calendar when I knew intuitively there should have been something. I couldn't, I didn't know what it was. It wasn't there. So at 105, I was busy on a project. My phone rang and the person who was calling, the information wasn't in my phone. So all I knew was that it was from an area code. So I answered the phone and I knew that this person, it was a sales call and that this person knew that they were supposed to be calling me and I wasn't sure who it was. And so I started to And years ago, I would have got rattled in my brain about, oh my God, what does this mean about me? What does this mean about my value? See, Ryan, you, 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 you didn't do your calendar. You, um, what is this person going to think? How are you going to, this is your livelihood. You're not taking this seriously. You know, I would have really eroded myself. What I did was in this time period, I could feel myself like, oh no, I see that I've made, uh, there's a gap here. Um, I listened to her. And I said, uh-huh. Okay, great. Now rem- remind me, uh, I can see that my, my technology has failed me today. Remind me of your name. Okay. And share with me what, what, what to do. And I just took, I took a couple seconds. I found my notes. I got settled. And as I got settled and as I was able to now, because I'm not hijacked, dial into her and dial into all these things she's saying that she's been able to do since our last conversation and how her life has changed. And, 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 and what I didn't do was say, Oh my God, but if you only knew, yeah, there's, you say I helped you, but if you only knew that at this moment, I'm melting down. I just listened and I held myself and I said, just find your way. We ended that call with that call being an affirmative sales call because I didn't hide. I just stood in my brilliance and I stood in my, my made a mistake. My computer didn't, system didn't work. I mean, tell me my brain, you know, and I just navigated my way back to my brilliant self as a coach. And so that's, but see, it's, it's like everyday life has the opportunity to hijack us. Yeah. 
That's that's great. Thank you so much, um, Ryan Lasan. For those of us who are interested in following you and contacting you, and um, there's an opportunity to take a, a, a test on your on your website. Um, how can we stay in touch? Yes, absolutely. Thank you for that question. So everything is on my website, which is inspirebrandconsulting.com. And on there, you can find the quiz that Sonia just talked about, um, which will give you a sense of which of the three, what I call confidence killers, whether that's imposter syndrome, perfectionism, or distractionism, might be the most prevalent for you. It's kind of like a People Magazine quiz. They're nice and short and simple with some good information. And then if you're interested in connecting and having a deeper dive into what you are experiencing personally, I offer a complimentary discovery call love to connect with you and hear about um, what you want, what you're finding is blocking you and how coaching and my process can help you. And then all of the social media and email and everything else can be found on that website as well. All right. Well, we will definitely be following you. I'm going to go on and take the um, the test. And uh, thank you because a lot of the information I know is helpful for our listeners today, but it was also very helpful for me, um, particularly you. someone I've, I've always identified myself as uncoachable, but I'm not going to use that negative language anymore to myself. Right? Awesome. Um, that was, that was very helpful in our discussion today. So um, we wish you continued success and hopefully have you back soon to talk about whatever new and exciting initiatives you'll be introducing in your program. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'd love that. And thank you all for listening and tuning in today. We'll be back again next week with another dynamic guest. Take care. The Business First podcast is hosted and produced by Sonia Aline, executive producer Ken Johnson. Find the Business First podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Odyssey, iHeartRadio, Amazon Music, TuneIn, or wherever you get your podcast. On social media, on IG, at business underscore first underscore podcast. Follow the Mean Old Line Media Podcast Network on IG at Mean Old Line Media. Get the Mean Old Line Media app in the App Store or Google Play. The Business First Podcast is a Mean Old Line Media production.